Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club event. I'm DJ Patel, former U.S. Chief Data Scientist and member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors. It is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Mac Fisher, who is the author of The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds uh, and our world. It's, it's also, this is work that's based on a final, uh, as he was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. It's an amazing read. Uh, everyone should pick up a copy of it and read it, especially for all of us here in Silicon Valley. Max is an international reporter, a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, his, his column, The uh, Interpreter, explores ideas and context behind major world events. He's been actually not just somebody who lives this virtually. He's been on the ground in many of these intense environments watching what has happened with social media engagement around the world. Before the Times, in 2016, Max worked at The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and was one of the founding editors of Vox.com. Before we get started, I want to encourage any of you and all of you who are submitting, uh, who are online watching this, to submit any questions for Max through the chat functionality on YouTube. And you can also follow Max on Twitter, at Max underscore F-I-S-H-E-R, Fisher. I'm on Twitter at dpatil, D-P-A-T-I-L. And for more great content, please follow the Commonwealth Club on Twitter at CW Club. Max, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for being here and congratulations on the book. It's, it's uh, I, I don't know exactly how to say this, awesome, terrifying, insightful, and, and like a lot of other <laughs> adjectives that are like, because it's so well documented. You do such a, a detailed chronology of what has happened through almost everything through web 2.0 up until this point. And I get to say that because I've also been one of the builders of the system web 2.0. So it's always fantastic as a person who's built this to get a look and say, Oh, that, yes, those that, that matches and also get new perspective on how it comes together. But the part I want to start with first is actually to rewind even more, because one of the things I think which is really interesting to me is generationally, you're a digital native. Like you you grew up with this technology. You were a, you're part of the population that shaped this, formed this. Friends of yours built it. And you were also, as a journalist, primarily advocating to organizations, <laughs> let's say like the publications that say, hey, we need uh, we need to have more foreign policy coverage online, and then these publications depend on social media. And so maybe let's the, the, take us a little further back on, in your journey how this came together because it's not I think exactly obvious how you start as a foreign <laughs> uh, specializing in, in in foreign issues to seeing all this come together. Yeah, you're absolutely right that when I when I started covering foreign affairs, God, almost 15 years ago now, the the work that I was doing was very oriented towards social media and not just using social media as a tool to report the way a lot of us did around, say, the Green Revolution in Iran or the Arab Spring, but in terms of really trying to write articles for social media. And like you were saying, when I was at... Um, the Atlantic at Vox at these very web forward publications, we would think a lot about these platforms are amazing because we can speak to the incentives of the platform. We can write headlines for the platform and that will help us win these huge audiences for stories that we care about and that we think are important that we would not be able to get otherwise. And this was at a time, you know, very different from now, 10 plus years ago, when we would not think twice about thinking about, well, what's going on with the Facebook algorithm? What's going on with the uh, cultural norms at Reddit and various subreddits that we can try to speak to and to gear not the actual reporting, but maybe the framing of a story or maybe a headline towards pleasing those systems. And I, I think that that is interesting to think about that now, both because the media's relationship with 
uh, social media platforms has obviously changed, but so has the general public's and the idea of speaking directly to the incentives of the platforms are something that we now understand has all of these other connotations in terms of what it pulls out. And is something that I think as the platforms have grown in influence and their systems have grown in power, now we're a little bit more wary of that. And now that's something that whether we're a reporter writing a headline or just a user writing a post, we're a little more thoughtful about the idea that maybe speaking fully to the incentives is something that is not so healthy for us and not so healthy for a society, even if we're not quite sure exactly what that relationship is or what those effects are. And it was one of the things that made me start to become really curious about this. In addition to all of the big things that were happening out in the world, you know, the 2016 election, the 2017 genocide in Myanmar, which I helped to cover from within the country, that led me as someone who never previously thought of social media as a story that was for me to cover. I thought that that was a kind of tech reporter story, but as a foreign affairs journalist covering, you know, conflict, uh, global politics, civil wars, suddenly started to think this is, um, it's not just a set of platforms where we go to post things and it's not just a vector through which we can reach people, but these platforms are actually incredibly powerful and are, are playing with our society or playing through our society in ways that we maybe did not fully understand. But I think that we have a much better understanding of now. Hmm. Maybe let's let's go back to, because you start actually, you tell this story in, in, in about Myanmar. And what happens, I think it's useful to maybe start there um, and talk about it because you, you have this quote that you talk about, which is, you know, is, is literally that how they're throwing babies in fires. I mean, literally throwing babies in fires and, and how, how, just tell us about that, of what that was, what you saw in the run up to Myanmar issues and what happened. Give us some context around this through through your eyes. Sure. So and obviously a very important caveat is that the Myanmar genocide as this huge complicated event like Trump's election is something that had many causes and many inputs. And of course, social media was just one of many. Um, and that's something I talk a lot about in the book is how it plays into a lot of the other factors that led to you know, in the case of Myanmar, this explosion of communal violence between the country's uh, Buddhist majority and a Muslim minority that lived mostly in the country's West. Uh, and when I went to Myanmar, I did not think that social media could be at all relevant to this story because the other forces were so huge. The history of racial and religious violence in the country, the political turmoil there was having this transition to democracy. And this, as often happens, there was this push and pull between kind of the governing elites there. But when I got there, like everyone who went to report in Myanmar and the genocide, it just became immediately clear that social media had some kind of a very significant role, even though none of us quite understood what it was. Um, I mean, first it was just a huge change because I had been there a couple of years before and you could not find a smartphone in the country. I mean, there would be literally, I heard a rumor when I was for the first time there that there was one in the capital city someplace, but no one was quite sure where it was. And now they were absolutely everywhere. And everybody was on Facebook because Facebook was zero rating its service as it does in a lot of developing countries in order to encourage a very heavy adoption because you know if you can't afford cellular data in a lot of these countries, but you can access the web for free on Facebook, then you learn to use Facebook for everything. You learn to use it for messaging, for reading news, for uh, the equivalent of email. Um, and what was just, it, what was stunning to see was that every conversation you would have with basically anyone in the country, whether it was a human rights worker, whether it was a member of a religious minority was being persecuted, whether it was an extremist figure who was trying to encourage this violence, would loop back around to Facebook because Facebook had just saturated this society and it would loop back to um, hate groups and extremist groups that had existed but had a much smaller reach and then Facebook came in and all of a sudden the reach is huge and you know it's easy to say well of course lots of people get a reach on Facebook but it, it seemed to be as we've seen in a lot of places the extremists who really benefited from the platform and not say um, mainstream outlets or mainstream journalists who also tried to adapt to Facebook and found that for whatever reason, their content was just not as preferred and not as liked and not as promoted by the platform. Uh, the conspiracy theories that people would pass around, and especially the process that we're now very familiar with from things like uh, 
January 6th or the summer of 2020, the process by which people would work each other up on the platforms and go from just passive consumers of hate speech, incitement, misinformation to active participants in it in ways that seem to create whole communities and whole identities in the case of Myanmar built around literally genocidal hate and literally genocidal communal violence in a way that had not existed before. Uh, and the untangling Facebook's actual role in the conflict is, um, you know, if we had five hours, we couldn't possibly get through it. I suffice to say that the uh, even the United Nations was alarmed enough about Facebook's role to say that it had played a determining role in the genocide. It's possible that's a little bit strong. It's possible that maybe it was a uh, exacerbating role. There were some other countries that I looked at where Facebook and other social platforms were clearly exacerbating uh, racial and religious violence. And there was one study in Germany that estimated that it increased about 15% of uh, racially motivated violence. That might be kind of a good rough figure to think about it, how much it's exacerbating these things. But if we're talking about on a scale of villages burned, destroyed, uh, entire populations run off, then you start to see the consequences of this get quite severe. And of course, since then, we have only seen more incidents that are not necessarily as bloody and as, as shocking as what happened in Myanmar. But this pattern, it, I mean, it was why I wrote the book, is that I was traveling after Myanmar, would hear this pattern over and over again of smaller scale versions of either the Myanmar phenomenon or the Trump phenomenon that seemed to follow this pattern over and over pretty much everywhere I went. And that always seemed to trace back to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or a couple other platforms. And, you know, obviously you've brought this up and you talk about this in the book is, is you brought this up to the executives and, and highlighted this to, to people at these platforms. What, what's, what was the, that, what was that like? And how did you get yeah. out of that? So I went to Facebook in, um, I don't want to say it was summer 2018. So it was, it was an interesting moment because and it was a point at which initially uh, the platform, the company had generally, as it does, uh, denied any kind of involvement and said, you know, we think that we're just a neutral platform. We're a neutral facilitator. All the good and the bad of society gets reflected through our pr platform. And it's ridiculous to say that we are doing anything to exacerbate any of this. The time I got there, the company's public position had shifted a little bit, and there was a little bit more of an attitude of um, mea culpa of actually our platform does have a propensity to uh, promote extremely provocative content. This is a what I would say an extremely light version of what uh, most outside researchers and as we later learned, Facebook's own internal researchers were in fact concluding about the platform's role in place like in excuse me in places like Myanmar, but. The conversation would start with, boy, we really messed up in Myanmar and now we're going to try to do better. But they would they would hit this weird cul-de-sac when I would talk to people where you would have these really sharp, smart and very candid conversations about things like moderation rules, uh, about things like regulations, about, you know, where do you draw the line between a post that's allowed and not allowed. But as soon as you would get into the pretty comprehensive research that uh, the platform was in fact, not just a neutral vessel, but that in fact tended to, for example, promote uh, race-based outrage or just outrage generally, or that it tended to promote certain kinds of conspiracy theories above other kinds of content, or there were its dynamics like uh, likes and shares tended to bring out uh, certain behaviors and certain tendencies in users, which again are things that Facebook's own researchers, though I didn't know it at the time, were reaching those same conclusions. I would bring this up and say, what do you think about this research? And it would be just like, um, eyes would kind of go blank and it would be like people would not understand the question and they would say, well, what do you mean? Of course, it's just a neutral platform. I would hear people compare it to cell phones and say, well, it's just like a cell phone. It's just a, it's just a communication portal from one person to another. So how could it possibly be driving anything else? And it was, it was really jarring to me because at that point there had been dozens of studies showing that the, not just what the platform does is not neutral, but that it has a, discrete, measurable, 
physical neurological effect on users, that it changes the behavior of users, that it changes their emotional makeup, that it changes their emotional affect and sentiment, that it leads to measurable changes in behavior in the way that people perceive right and wrong. And of course, in context of the entire history of these companies, that's not surprising at all because they were designed and built deliberately to change people's behavior. And they were designed deliberately to play into your neurochemistry with things like dopamine to act like a drug. And of course, as we know, drugs are not just addictive. They also change your behavior. Um, and so it was very surprising to see this shift that had taken place where before the consequences had gotten so large, it was very, you know, it was very common to hear people in the Valley talk about, yes, we are going to, we're going to change society. We're going to change the way the world works. Rick Zuckerberg talk about, we are rewiring human nature and society from the ground up. And then as soon as they started to see what the consequences of that were, all of a sudden it was, no, no, we're just a neutral platform. So the, the cognitive of dissonance there, which sometimes would go away if you went off the record. Sometimes you would say, okay, yes, I do know what's going on, uh, was, was jarring, I would say, from the meetings. Well, when you look at now, like, you know, a, the research article comes out about, you know, uh, girls and body issues on Instagram, uh, or, you know, pick your flavor of, of where there's a scientific kind of assessment with some understanding of brain chemistry or other uh, behavioral aspects you know, you kind of go from what's happening in Myanmar to what's happening in our backyard. How, how does that process for you as you're kind of looking at these different scales and cultures? That was what I thought of as a lot of the challenge of the book is trying to identify at the most basic fundamental level how the platform interplays with your psychology uh, and with your behavior. Because on the one hand, you can kind of look at the 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 like the end effects at the the end of the kind of causal chain where you know we look at the front end and we say, okay, we know that Instagram has posts with likes on it and that its algorithm will select posts based on engagement. And then we know at the back end that kids who use it feel bad about themselves. And you know, how but how do those two things link together? How does it actually work? Uh, and I, what I, the challenge that I set out for myself was not just to wave the study about, you know, kids feel bad and say, oh, this means that social media is bad or not to just guess and say, well, here's my theory for what effect it actually has, but to try to work with what turned out to be a pretty significant number of leading experts around the world who were also looking into this because, you know, a lot of people were, had a sense that its effects were profound, but not well understood. So working with um, neuroscientists, with cognitive psychologists, the social psychologists, uh, with political scientists, network analysts who are studying the platforms, people in the Valley. Uh, and the, I think it helped, it helped me to understand it at the most fundamental level as something that is designed to train you to conduct certain behaviors. I can give you an example for one study yeah. that I, I cite a lot because I think it's one that helps me understand it at kind of a basic primordial level. Is a study where uh, a group of researchers sat down a bunch of research subjects, and before the experiment, they tested all of the research subjects on their level of natural outrage. I mean, how prone were they as people to feeling or expressing outrage? And then when the experiment, they had some of those people in the experiment group send a a fake tweet, basically in a fake Twitter platform so that they could control the experience that expressed some outrage that had... Um, what are called moral emotional words in it, which are a certain set of words that express outrage. And, and they showed them those tweets and they showed some of them those tweets that had a lot of engagement on it. Or in other words, they, they made them think this fake tweet you sent, it got a lot of fake retweets and fake likes, which is something that we know that the platform or any platform even though it's a fake Twitter here, but think of it, it's, it's works with any of them, is very likely to do because one study or enough after another has found that these systems on these platforms will artificially promote the reach of things with moral emotional words. And then there's one study that found that just every moral emotional outrage word increases the reach of your tweet by 20%, which is huge, especially when you consider the fact that that stacks at two, three, or four words. Um, so we know that if you send a tweet or a Facebook post with outrage in it, you are likelier to get much more engagement. The platform will select that and will show that to more people because that will get a response from other people that will increase their engagement and then that will increase your engagement. And what we're they found wired to, to, we're wired to respond to outrage. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And it wasn't someone in, you know, at Facebook was saying, hey, outrage seems like it's a really a great thing that we want to promote, but rather just the machine learning systems had through the, you know, enormous amount of trial and error that they do just stumbled upon these words. And because like you said, that is basic human nature. We find those words just absolutely like electric jolts to our brain engaging. And they also make us want to act in turn, which the platform really likes. It likes when you act. So in the experiment, and they showed the people these fake tweets they had sent that had lots of likes and shares and retweets on them, it did two things. It made those people likelier to want to voluntarily send more fake tweets, or they thought they were real, tweets with outrage in it in the future. But the really stunning thing was when they would test those people, including when they were away from the computer, when they were away from social media, their level of outrage had changed. It had gone up. Their fundamental nature had been retrained. And that is something that in the context of social media sounds shocking, but in the context of social psychology makes perfect sense because we know that the way people work is that when it comes to emotional sentiment, that we respond incredibly well to social feedback and a feeling of social validation when we behave a certain way doesn't just make us constantly consciously want to do that more, but it is so powerful to us that it makes our brain, uh, our brain learns to uh, instill that in us internally so that we will have an internal drive to repeat that behavior. And social media delivers social validation way out of scale with anything that we are evolved to deal with. You know, we're evolved in communities of maybe 100, 150 people. So that that's about where we max out cognitively. There's even a name for it. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know it. It's the Dunbar limit. And when you're getting 300 likes and you're getting it regularly, maybe you're getting it a couple of times a day or a few times a week, anytime you pick up your phone, that is just such a powerful signal to your brain that it actually changes the way that you feel and it changes the way that you behave, including when you're away from social media. So I think that kind of, and there's many examples like that in the book of the way that it's social media kind of. Or, or in the case, like you become comparison, you say, Hey, this person posted on Reddit, they got N likes. I want to mm -hmm. be, you know, double N <laughs> right. that. So I should be that much more outrageous to try to right. listen. And, and right. you, you yeah. actually, there's this great, you, you talk about, you know, this this moment of how everything is intertwined from Gamergate, which we should go into mm -hmm. what that actually is, all True. the way through to the uh, election of Trump and Charlottesville and so much other things. And, you know, the quote is, you know, from uh, from Steve Bannon, you can activate an army. They come through Gamergate or whatever, and then they get turned on to politics and Trump. Uh, end quote. And and so what I thought about as I was reading this is, and and this isn't just happening on, it's happening on YouTube, it's happening on you know Reddit, it's happening on lots of platforms, not just one platform specific as you as you highlight. But I thought, isn't this a definition of radicalization? Isn't this like what we were calling out with what Al Qaeda was doing? And, and whether you know you call it out for the right or the left, I'm not making a political judgment here. I'm making more of a statement about sociology and how people define things. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious to your lens of maybe take us a little bit through that Gamergate through to to the um, to the uh, like how we got to January 6th. Even right. I know it's a large time frame, uh, but maybe give us a little bit of view of that and how you saw people fall down the rabbit hole, the radicalization, all these kind of things help tie us, help, help give us some clarity and how to think about this. Sure. So I can actually, it, to, I think to set up Gamergate January 6, I can give you another example that shows, I think the template for how this happens. And like you were alluding to most importantly, the fact that it affects everyone. It's easy to think this is just the extremists. It's just the QAnons. It's just the kind of nut jobs. It's not me. It's not the people who I know, but one of the, um, I think, most important things that I took away from reporting this book is this This cycle does play out for absolutely everybody on the platform, including me. I'm on the platform, and it affects me just the same way. Um, I don't know if, if you or if anybody remembers Cecil the Lion, 2014. So there was this lion in Zimbabwe. There was an American the dentist who... Uh, shot and killed this lion in a kind of legal gray area. It got posted on Reddit. And within like three days, 
the outrage first on Reddit and then on Twitter and then on YouTube at this dentist for shooting this lion who no one had ever heard of before, but all of a sudden everyone felt very emotionally attached to had escalated into, I think you could fairly call literally a national frenzy. Uh, you know, my outlet, the New York times, they wrote many times about it. It was all over late night talk shows. Uh, people were showing up in mobs at this dentist's house, at his dental practice. Uh, he had to go into hiding and his family had to go into hiding because the anger had reached such a fever pitch. And the way that this works, which is the exact same way that Gamergate works and is, is a component of how January 6th worked, although January 6th, like Myanmar, is something that obviously had a lot of non-social media and non-digital causes to it, which was that um, it started with just one post that the way that Reddit works happened to surface it because it expressed a extremely high level of moral, emotional outrage. And outrage is different from anger. Anger is, uh, you know, someone cut me in line and I'm upset at them. Outrage is an anger that you feel uh, on behalf of your community against a social transgression. So that could be um, someone cheating, uh, someone behaving in a way that is bigoted, um, someone doing you know, harassment. Yeah. Bro police brutality is a great example is a source of, because we are trying to police social norms by expressing outreach against that. Uh, this post just tapped into this perfect amount of social outrage. And the way that Reddit works, it's kind of like a Facebook algorithm with it. The Facebook algorithm is that people were upvoting it because it made them angry. They were leaving comments because it made them angry. Lots of people were seeing the comments. And like you alluded to, once you see that, oh, if I post a comment that gets angry at this dentist, I will get a lot of social validation in the form of likes. You start to post more and more of those. Many people start uh, participating in this. The anger becomes infectious. People start to feel it internally, which then gets communicated out to everyone else. Uh, and then it, it jumped to Twitter, which has, you know, an outrage dynamic that we're all very familiar with, which is that one tweet encapsulates the outrage really well. It gets enough engagement. The system picks it up. It shows it to lots of other users because the system has learned this is a post that's going to make people very excited. And of course, it's not just the, the platforms, but also human nature. The human nature, when you see everyone in your community getting mad is to um, trick yourself into suddenly caring an awful lot about it. Uh, we have an incredible cognitive weakness around anything that appears like it's a point of social consensus, especially if it's social consensus around an outrage. Um, the, word, the phrase mob mentality has become very politically loaded, but that is actually a basic human instinct that goes back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, a lot of evolutionary, evolutionary anthropologists believe, which is why it is something that is so powerful when it gets activated. When you see a hundred tweets on the platform that say, you know, the dentist who killed Cecil is a monster and he has to die. Those hundred people might represent a tiny, tiny minority, but you are going to see an outsized share of them because that outrage rises on the platform because it gets more engagement because the algorithms in the system will put those at the top of your feed because they will engage you. You see those hundred people, it's, you know, 1% of 1% of all the users, but it feels to you like a hundred percent of your Twitter experience. You internalize that outrage yourself. It feels real to you. Now you're angry at the dentist legitimately. Like you feel an actual anger term. You, contribute to it, it snowballs, and then enough people get together and decide we have to go to this dentist's house who, absent the snowballing outrage effect of the platforms, would never have cared because none of these people have been to Zimbabwe, none of these people have met Cecil the Lion. Um, I like to use that example because it's one that I think a lot of us can relate to and maybe some of us even participated in. But what happened with Gamergate was exactly the same dynamic, it's except instead of... Our Activate an army, exactly right. Except that the target of it in this case was um, uh, first one woman in particular, a video game developer, and then several other women who were involved in the video game industry who were named basically in a nonsense conspiracy theory claiming that women in the gaming industry were plotting to uh, feminize games and to therefore suppress the masculine spirit of young men, which, you know, sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous, but it spoke to this thing called identity threat, which you mentioned radicalization and an identity threat is the, it's the button that you mash to do radicalization. 
And it is this sentiment that says that my in group, my social group is under existential threat from an out group, some other social group that's out there. It's uh, feminists versus gamers or whatever. And we have to defend against them because they're coming to get us. And it's there's even a name for it. Extremist researchers called it crisis solution. The idea is that you package up this pitch to say all the problems in your life aren't because, you know, you're having trouble finding work or because you're depressed or because the economy is rough, but it's because of this outgroup that is posing a threat to you. It's posing this identity threat. And platforms have become very, very effective at identifying this sentiment and promoting it. Because again, the systems have learned these specific combinations of word, this identity threat is something that plays so well with people that it charges people up. It doesn't just make them want to mash the like and the share button, but it makes them want to contribute posts themselves, which is the ultimate aim of these platforms is to get other people engaged. And you see this over and over again. You see it in empirical research. We've all seen it in our day-to-day -day lives that anything that characterizes, for example, day-to-day -day politics or even your local school board meeting as a matter of, you know, the woke mob is coming to get us or a local minority is coming to get us or developers are coming to get us and we have to rally to go get them is something that is very powerful. So it saturates the platform and then it bypasses our cognitive defenses so that we participate in it too. So Max, we're getting starting to get a bunch of interesting questions and it's just a reminder to, the, to the, all of you out there, please put your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll, we'll take them. And there's sort of an irony here as we're talking about this and communicating the, the, uh, through these social media channels. You know, um, before I want to, I want to go to some of the good things that people uh, uh, to, to also hear about platforms and some of the positive, but before sure. we go to that, yeah. I want to stay on this line of the, the internet vigilantes and, and predominantly you know, how you think about this with regards to the activities. You know, I, I think about, as you called out on Gamergate, these women who were falsely accused, uh, people who came to their defense also then got attacked. Uh, and, and when we say attacked, I mean, real physical threats here. People threw, you know, not only rocks through their windows, but were swatted where they called, somebody called 911 and says they're under threat and the SWAT team shows up, which is horrifying. But we've also seen like around... You know, the Boston bombings where, the you know, people are uh, trying to identify people and get the wrong person or recently with monkeypox. But we've also seen where we see people around police brutality videos. And, you know, the classic line there is Internet, do your thing or somebody who's acting is in a in an incredibly offensive, racist manner. You know, it, you know, pick your favorite car, uh, you know, coffee shop. And, and it, it, like how. It's hard to get your rationale because on one side, you're like, hey, you want social justice and it appeals to us. And we want to see that these behaviors called out at the same time. Sometimes they're wrong. How what, what should we how should we think about this and how do we make sure we're on the right side of this? These issues. Right. It's I think you're you're good to highlight that this could be a positive effect of social media, that it empowers people collectively and communities to call out social transgressions and social wrongs or outright illegal acts that normally might not get attention. There's a, an episode I spent a long time in the book is the uh, Central Park incident of summer 2020. Uh, that is not something that would have been called out and, and punished without social media. And of course, the effect of that punishment is not just to uh, you know, provide justice for the victim of this incident who was threatened in an extremely racist way in Central Park, but to act as like all social punishment, to act as a deterrent and a message to the community more broadly, you know, hey, threatening someone and threatening to call poli the police on them in a way that is meant to threaten their lives is not something that is going to be tolerated by society, so it shouldn't be done. That's a normal health and functioning society that social media has uh, improved because it allows communities to do that without gatekeepers. But I think what was really interesting about that incident was uh, all of the other things that were happening on social media, um, like the weeks before that, um, there were so many other incidents of what seemed to be uh, uh, this kind of social justice, but that it turned out to be um, 
a faked incident. It turned out to be someone who was uh, basically a hoaxer who had done it to call someone out uh, for a made up thing for attention or in some cases to try to get money. Uh, a lot of it was um, some really wild conspiracy theories on both the right and the left about a, a COVID stimulus bill that was going around that time. And I thought it was important to line those up to show that a purely neutral social media platform would indeed enable both good and bad uses of it for the purposes of punishing social transgressions. And it would really be up to the people on it to determine which way to point that. But something that we see over and over again, especially when you zoom out and you look at all of these cases is that, of course, these platforms are not neutral and there are certain things that they amplify over other things. Uh, and one of those things is, um, us versus them outrage is is tribalism is a sense of identity threat and false information that feeds into those because they might the platforms might feel like they are a tool for us to do social justice but they don't really belong to us because we're not really picking what goes up we're not picking what goes at the top of the feed the algorithms and the other systems they are picking what goes on the top of the feed and they're not doing it with a any hostility towards social justice but it is engineered overwhelmingly towards increasing engagement so that the companies can maximize their revenue. And this is something that I heard a lot from like Arab Spring activists who in 2011 were like naming their kids Mark Zuckerberg because they were just so blown away by the power of this platform by allowing the community to use it to channel political activity to foment this incredible change. But within three or four years, a lot of them saw, um, in fact, there was someone who even uh, was a, a, an Egyptian revolutionary who left his job at Google to go fight in the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt and then left because he said that the, the platforms, we thought that they were promoting what we wanted to put on them, but they were promoting division, they were promoting hatred, they were promoting conspiracy theories that ultimately did more to tear our society apart than they did to pull it together. And I think you have to see those two things. You have to see that it's doing both of them. And sometimes you hear from the companies as well, you have to take the good with the bad because they're both part of social media. And, you know, if you like that it's doing social justice, then you have to accept that we're going to promote certain things for the way we put this bluntly, but promote certain things to make money because that's how it works. But it doesn't actually have to work that way. Uh, so much of the harm comes from these systems and the platforms that are meant to artificially inflate engagement and that are meant to engage your emotions and to put certain kinds of content in front of you that will compel you to interact with them more. That is where all the distortion comes from. Uh, I mean, also, of course, bad actors, I shouldn't say all, that is where an enormous amount of the distortion comes from. And we've seen platforms that were neutral that did not have these features before. And you could have a kind of organizing for social shaming, for social justice, that, that it didn't have this consistent pull towards misinformation and extreme tribalism right. and radicalization. Yeah. Well, so, so one of the things I think, which is also, I, I thought what you highlighted really well in the book was that it, this, an Arab Spring is a great example because so much hope, so much enthusiasm and not yeah. the impact. We've also, as you highlight, there's so many more marches that have been able to galvanize huge populations, but without the stickiness. And at the same time, we've seen Russian interference most recently reported about um, basically pitting organizers of the uh, women's march against each other and forcing those to collapse. And maybe this leads away because I think we're, we're, we're sort of laying this a lot on classic social network of, of um, um, like Facebook and Twitter. And maybe we could go to the role that video has played in this because uh, the, the amount of hours where people are actually spending time on these platforms is so much towards video platforms, YouTube, others, TikTok, it should probably be included in that of high inbound content. And could you talk to us a little bit about what you found about those platforms and what goes well, what doesn't go well? Because I think of it on one side is I can look up how to how to make some amazing recipe today, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I might end up down a rabbit hole. Right, yeah. So YouTube, I think was, was one that I had been hearing about for years while reporting on Facebook and Twitter. So many people who I know inside the Valley and out of it were saying, you know, you should really be looking at YouTube because its influence is way beyond what is widely understood and maybe even greater than these other platforms. But it's not as obvious. It's not as easy to spot because you think you're just watching 
a video. How harmful could it be? And the only obvious effect from the platform is that it will queue up a video to watch after that. So you're just, you're watching one thing after another, you know, it's, it's harder to see the system as a whole in the way you can kind of step back and look at all of Twitter. You can browse around at Facebook and see all of them. YouTube is a lot more opaque. Um, but the place where I really got pointed, the more I would talk to people about, well, how do I actually understand what YouTube's influence is, was to uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil is YouTube's second largest market. It is very similar to the United States politically and its social makeup. Uh, something that I had not realized until I went there to go to report on the claims that I was hearing from people that YouTube was having a enormously significant role in Brazilian politics and society is that uh, Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, became the president in 2018. He's far right guy as compared to Trump a lot. He had actually gotten his start on YouTube. I mean, he was, he was a lawmaker, but he was kind of a fringe lawmaker. He had very little following outside of his constituency. He was viewed as a total wacko, but really big on YouTube. Um, and something that happened that we found was that um, around 2017, YouTube upgraded its algorithms, upgraded its recommendation system, is that it all of a sudden started recommending people into a lot of Bolsonaro videos, into a lot of people on the far right who were associated with Bolsonaro or who had similar political views. And again, that is something that in itself, how influential could that possibly be? And so we thought, okay, well, let's look at this and see how much of this recommendation is it actually doing? And I'm just showing people a Bolsonaro video. You know, I turn on CNN and I might see, say a politician on there who I disagree with, but that doesn't mean that it's brainwashing me to disagree with that politician. And we found that the platform is having this, uh, was doing something really, really powerful, which we then later also saw doing with um, health misinformation and with far right extremism and radicalization in a couple other countries, including the United States, which is that it would take someone who had watched any video that was anywhere even proximate to politics, or to social issues, or maybe even like a step away from it, maybe even someone who was just watching a gaming video, and it would nudge them incrementally, but very steadily towards videos that were more and more aligned with Bolsonaro and default rate politics. And it would pull them into this kind of spiral where you would watch one video and then another, and it was just not an obvious step towards, oh, I'm now I'm watching the far right, but it would be a little bit more extreme and a little bit more associated with the far right. And something that the YouTube system had done that was frankly kind of brilliant is that it had taken all of these networks of channels and all these different videos that did not actually have a real world association. And it had started linking them together in these big kind of daisy chains. So that if you were on the platform, you would be fed through Bolsonaro, far right politics, uh, anti-vaccine conspiracies, Illuminati conspiracies, but this very tight cluster. We did this work with this guy, did this incredible analysis showing uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of recommendations, how it would route you through the system. And it would just pull people in through over and over this larger world of uh, this kind of political social identity the platform had essentially constructed out of nothing because before then Bolsonaro had been quite small. And what we did with this network analysis where we we're tracking the commenters too, is we found the commenters that got pulled into this because it was very incremental. The sentiment in their comments would start gradually changing over time to mirror what they were seeing in the video because they got this false consensus. They've so been co-opted. Their brain had literally been co-opted by matching. They're mirroring. They're, they're effectively mirroring, mirroring. the two videos. Is that, exactly. is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Right. Because it felt like it's like there's hundreds of videos and they're all saying the same thing and they all have a million views on them. So it must be that everybody feels this way. Everybody agrees with this and it starts to feel participatory. It starts to feel true. And then it would start then dropping into these networks, a new conspiracy theory, anything just to keep people on. I mean, the goal is not to change Brazilian politics. The goal is just to like keep them watching the platform for many, many, many hours it started constructing this larger movement effectively. And this is something you would even hear from people in Bolsonaro's political party. I mean, like senior people, you would say, how did you come to this and say, I wasn't political, but I was on YouTube, I was bored. And it just started showing me these videos and they were shocking and they were interesting and they held my attention and they were captivating. And over time, even though I was on a lot of these people, people who had been on the left, they said, this is someone who it makes a lot of sense to me. And I found this larger community through it. And again, this is something that if we're talking about an entire political movement. It might sound kind of hard to buy, but I bet 
I bet that everybody who is watching this knows someone in their family who had a similar experience with um, COVID misinformation, for example. And this is, again, something where it's not just one video pops up on your screen and it says George Soros gave you COVID because he wants to give you a mind control vaccine. But the system is very, very effective. It's incredibly powerful algorithms at pulling you through the specific chain of videos that no one at Google said we want to brainwash people. No one's trying to do that. They're just trying to keep you watching. But it just so happens that this process of radicalization, because that's what it is, is just, it's incredibly engaging. It's addictive. Mm. That's so fascinating. There, there's a lot of great questions that are coming on. Keep bringing them in. I'm trying to roll them into kind of bundle them because they're so they're, they're really great ones. Maybe one of that that um, kind of takes us a step a little bit back to what these companies work with a lot of other organizations also as they're figuring this out. There's the role of the technologist and specifically one that people asked about was Cambridge Analytica and the role that these kind of organizations played and the data scientists, myself being included as a data scientist and been responsible on many of these platforms. I'm curious what your take is with the, the, the role of both the people, the engineers in these companies, these other companies like Cambridge Analytica or other places, and, and how should we think about them? So this is something that I've thought about a lot from talking to engineers who work at the company from talking to people who are trying to organize the engineers at these companies, um, whether they're union organizers or people who are in the Valley and just see, you know, I mean, these are the people who are, are building the product and this is the kind of the rank and file, the people on the ground who are really doing the work. They're trying to bring them around because lots of other parts of the companies I think have had kind of reckonings about, uh, what their products do, but it's not happened as much at the engineering sides. And, you know, something that I've really been struck by is that um, a lot of the engineers of these companies have been really fed a lot of information from their uh, corporate chiefs and from their management that is not true. Uh, they are told a lot that these platforms are neutral and the media is lying and they're making it up and these uh, social scientists are lying and they're making it up because they don't understand that we're out here, you know, saving the world and making people's lives better. And uh, they just want to tear you down and discourage you because they hate your success. And um, I think it's, it's, it's starting to break through that um, that's not an accurate representation of what the research on these products show. You know, you can, you can believe my description of them or not, but you can go and look at this research yourself and you can see what it says. Uh, and I've, I've, I've been really, really struck at the informational wall that a lot of these companies try to put up around their engineers, because I think they understand that it's getting harder to retain people as the uh, understanding shifts that they are not, maybe not working at the revolution company as they were told when they were recruited. I mean, that's the phrase that Mark Zuckerberg has used, but it maybe it's something a little bit closer to a cigarette company and it's producing something that is incredibly lucrative and is very commercially successful, but that might be harmful for people. And that, that makes your labor and your management problems tough. Um, now, that doesn't mean that if you're an engineer at this company, you're responsible for everything that the product does. You know, I work for a big institution and, you know, sometimes it does things that are outside of my control and that's just how it goes to work at a big company. Um, but I think it is worth thinking about if you're uh, thinking about going to work for one of them. I know a lot of social scientists and political scientists, the academic job market is extraordinarily tough right now. And a lot of them take jobs at Facebook and Google. And what they're told when they're recruited is you can affect more change from within than you can from the outside. And if you get a nice house in the process, don't you probably deserve it anyway? And um, that's a tough judgment call that everyone has to make on their own. But I, I know an awful lot of people who went and then left after two or three years because uh, they found it hard to stomach. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe this gets to one of these questions uh, that was re that was asked here is after the 2016 elections, you know, we heard a, a tremendous amount about how they were going to they were going to do more to prevent misinformation. The election integrity team at, at Facebook, uh, YouTube put a team in place. Twitter said they were going to do things. W what did they actually do? Uh, has it worked? And we have a midterm coming up. And yeah. what, what, what do you see happening? So I, 
I, I actually have a lot of respect for a lot of the people who have worked at those integrity teams because a lot of them do very good work. A lot of them hire very skilled, talented people who are working really hard to, and Facebook actually puts out some incredibly great open source supports on this, to identify uh, government actors, malign actors, to spot them and root them out from the platform. But it is a, it's a Sisvian task and it's a, um, some have called it an impossible job. Some have called it a doom job because uh, you're what you're effectively doing is you're cleaning up things that are partly the result of outside actors who are trying to exploit the tendencies of the platforms, but in many ways are driven by the tendencies of the platforms, or at least severely exacerbated by it. So that uh, the analogy I used at one point in the book is it's it's a little like being a um, air freshener on the outside of a big chemical factory where. The factory is churning out more and more chemicals. You could put as many air fresheners as you want outside of it, but it's going to continue to produce, mis produce misinformation. And in fact, this is something that we saw after 2016, after 2018, that there's, oh, we've got election war rooms, we've got integrity teams, we're doing all these great things to pull down all the misinformation. But by the way, this other part of the company over here that is responsible for boosting revenue and actually designs the systems, they have upgraded our group's recommendation feature. They've upgraded our uh, video recommendation algorithm. They've changed the way that your Twitter newsfeed works to produce more engaging tweets. And what do you know? Every single time, misinformation on the platform demonstrably, as best we can tell from every outside measurement, goes up instead of down. Well, we're about to enter a period of, uh, we're entering rougher economic waters. Stocks are down, prices are down, you know, people are shutting down very, the, 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 the experimental parts of the, these businesses. Uh, that would seem to indicate that there would be a desire to, crank up the dial of engagement, get more ads out there, get more people viewing, more people looking. And yet we have, uh, we have democracy on the line in many ways because we have an election. And if it's allowed to be interfered with by foreign actors or, you know, conspiracies happen to undermine the, the, um, the trust in election, that seems really dangerous. You know, if you look forward from now, just say six months from now or a year from now, what what do you want us to take away as how we should be thinking about this? What action should we be taking? A person raised the question of what countermeasures should we be putting in place? What What's our playbook? How should we make sure we're safe? Our friends are safe. G give us the... Give us the, the, throw us a life raft. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean as a, like as an individual or kind of. Well, I think there's individual and there's the, 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 there's the broad organizational thing, but time is short before these things seem to hit on the next wave of things. So I'm wondering, yeah. especially with the economic pressure where right. we may think of the platforms as stationary, they may have to change things for their own self-interest and right. just how, how do we, how do we navigate through this? So the, the individual answer is very different from the uh, society-wide answer. I'll give you the individual answer first, because it's, you, you can't escape the fact that we live in a world that's dominated by social media. I use it, you use it. I would bet that most people who are watching this use it and you kind of don't have any choice. Uh, and even if you did have the ability to throw away your smartphone and live without social media, then that actually would not change that much for you individually because so many of social media's effects are atmospheric. They come to you through the way that it changes politics or the way that it changes social norms, whether you're on it or not. But the number one piece of advice that I give individuals for how to cope with this world that we are in with these social platforms as powerful as they are is to try to change how you think of it from a uh, portal through which you connect with people and try to think of it like a uh, like a drug because that's what it is that's how it acts that how that's how it acts on your brain that's how it acts on behavior and that doesn't mean that it should be outlawed and you should never use it um, I had two cups of coffee this morning I will probably have glass of wine, two glasses of wine tonight. Uh, we all- Is that drugs. a remark about me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about the wine. Uh, you'll need wine. Oh, okay, now. okay, okay, yeah. No, 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 I, to celebrate our great chat is what I'll have, I'll have a glass of champagne. Um, 
No, I mean, we, 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 we have learned to have to have drugs, including some like alcohol or like nicotine that are very dangerous, how to have them in our lives. And the way that we've learned how to do that is by being extremely conscious of their effects and by managing their effects based on what's going to be healthy for us. You know, I'll have one glass of wine, maybe two, but I'm not going to have eight, but we all check social media a lot more than eight times a day. The average is something like 12 or 15, depending on how you measure it. Um, and I will also only take it at certain times. And if I do take it, what I think is most important, if I take a drink, I will know how to differentiate the alcohol's effect on me versus what I would think otherwise or what I actually want to do. You know, if I'm out at the bar with some friends and something seems like a good idea, I might think, okay, that's actually the second beer that I had that's telling me to do that. And I think that once you start to use social media this way, and I've heard this from a lot of people who've read the book and have like come to really understand these effects and understand what it's due to, once you see it, it becomes much easier to control for it, becomes much easier to manage how you deal with the kind of pull that it exerts on you. And you also become much more thoughtful about, you know, maybe there's some kinds of content that are just not healthy for you as an individual to consume on it. News is probably the biggest one, anything politically related, politically charged discussions, socially charged discussions are the things that I hear a lot of people say, you know what, I've decided that it just, that's not healthy for me to do on social media. So I'm not going to do it. It becomes much easier to mute its effects, at least on you personally, and to identify those effects when they're happening. Now, what are we going to do as a society? Boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think you would know that better than I would. Uh, the number one piece of advice I got from experts who I talked to who were studying this, I said, if you had a, a magic button, you know, a magic genie, and you could change anything, which regulation, the way the platforms work, the way that capitalism works, what would it be? They all had some version of the same answer, which is to turn off the engagement maximizing features, which is of course a non-starter. That's never going to happen. But I think it's useful as a thought exercise for separating out what is actually harmful from social media, what's distorting from it, and what are the factors of it that are fine or are truly neutral. And it was always um, the algorithms, the recommendation systems, uh, a feed that is sorted by what the system is selected for you, even the like button. Uh, I mean, Jack Dorsey, before he left Twitter, even right. he said, maybe having a little counter that shows you the number of likes on the bottom of your post and Instagram is even kind of come around to this. Maybe that does something really harmful to you. It blows my mind, by the way, that Instagram on the one hand took the proactive step, which I thought was a really good step to take that number off, but also they still insist that no, this platform doesn't have any effect on your behavior. Where would you possibly come up with that crazy notion? So it's and I'm on my soapbox about the cognitive dissonance, but that that was the answer I'd always get from people. Now, how how you actually bring that about, I have no idea. What what behavior uh, change have you question. done? What what's the behavior change that you have done after researching this book? Oh, man. I Reporting this book, uh, there were a couple of moments where I took some very, very hard stop changes in how I use social media. Um, I almost never have uh, discussions on it, never have back and forths, because I've just, now that I've seen how effectively and how deeply they are manipulated by the platform and for the fact that you're not actually having a pure interaction with, with real people, you're having an interaction that is being guided and controlled by these machines. It's just... I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, once I started to, I took a break for a few months at one point because I was so disturbed by some of what I was finding. And I just, I just felt different. I just felt less angry. I felt less outraged. I felt more uh, like I had a more nuanced understanding of news that I came across. So I try not to consume news on it. I'll see a headline, of course, but then I'll try to read it separately from the platforms and not read the platform discourse. Uh, I almost never do um, responses to people. And if I use any system that has an algorithm, I try to watch it in my incognito window because then the recommendations will just be a little bit less effectively tailored and it'll be maybe a little bit less effective at hooking you in. That's something that I know a lot of people do. Um, yeah, incognito for those that don't know is just the browser being in private mode or is it is an anonymous mode. Exactly. Yeah. But mostly I just, I try to be on it as little as I can. And when I am on it, I try, I especially try to not express emotions on it. I mean, once I, once I read all these studies about the, how effectively these systems are at manipulating your emotions and getting you to perform emotions, I just, it really upset me. 
And I, I really try now to just never to tailor a post to what do I think is going to get likes? What do I think is going to get shares? And my posts now get a lot less engagement as a result, but I just, I feel much better about the experience of being on it. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left and I want to touch on one area that's critical for many of the user, reader or listeners and people on online here uh, is we have an increasing amount of Asian violence in our communities. Uh, and there's a lot that's been discussed, both outrage on social media uh, or and, and as well as people who have fostered uh, um, a narrative of violence against uh, Asia, Asian Americans and the Asian population, the AAPI communities. What should I'd love to know what you think about this? So I'll, I'll keep this brief because I know, as you said, we just have a moment. There's a, a long section in the book, uh, a, a, the book of a chapter that deals with some really cutting edge research in Germany, showing the way that Facebook in particular, but social media generally because of these incentives and these uh, emotions that it pulls out and the sense of tribalism and fear of the outsider, that it increased uh, outrage towards and suspicion of and hostility towards, in this case, refugees, significantly enough across entire communities that the people at the far ends of those communities, the people who are already a little bit prone to violence, became significantly likelier to launch a racist attack against a refugee. Uh, and that is that's a dynamic that um, I mean, the Germany story is instructive because we actually show that it's happening and show that it's not just the extremists on the platform who get radicalized, but that it's the entire community becoming, you know, 5%, 8%, whatever it is, more hateful that leads to those attacks. And I think that that is important to understanding the way that these platforms generally, by increasing the sense of fear, suspicion, hatred of what people perceive to be cultural outsiders, or outgroups, that it can increase the likelihood that we've seen this over and over of a loner vigil anti-violence. And in the United States, as you said, the, the context for this, that the way that often plays out is uh, anti-Asian vigil anti-violence. Yeah. Um, I want to end with uh, the last couple of minutes here with giving you time to talk about some of the people we don't hear about on the, the platforms or inside the organization, the moderators. Uh, you know, we've talked about the people who build the systems, but there's also these people who are uh, the moderators and what this does to them, what it does to their societies. Uh, and you've spent a lot of time with these people. So there's one moderator in particular who is a, a whistleblower. He's moderated for an outsourcing company that worked for Facebook, brought me a lot of internal documents. And he, like a lot of folks who I talked to, he's a real true believer in social media. He, I, I can't tell you the country that he's in. He really thought that Facebook was going to do incredible things for his country. He adores Silicon Valley. He thinks that it is, you know, this is the place, this is the center of innovation, global leadership. He still feels this way, even after he brought me all these documents that were evidence of, let us say, less than great behavior by the company. Uh, but these people have it really tough and not just in the sense that they are viewing really horrible content day in and day out that oftentimes these systems are artificially promoting. So they don't, they don't actually have to see it. I mean, yes, people are going to post horrible things no matter what, but again, they're, they're the, the janitors cleaning up the, uh, you know, the spillage from the big chemical plant. The chemical plant could maybe just produce a few co fewer chemicals. They wouldn't have as much work to do. But they're also because they work for these outsourcing companies, these big third party like call centers, basically. Something I thought was really fascinating is they're not directly employed by Facebook, which means they're not directly directed by Facebook. And one of the things that I found in working with this guy, this moderator, is that um, some of these big companies, they will do a lot of things they're not supposed to do with these workers. They'll give them these incredibly long hours. They will... Um, tie their pay to the number of posts that they review per hour, which is a terrible incentive because it means their incentive is just to click through as many as they can rather than to consider, is this post dangerous or not? Does it break any rules or not? Um, and they were not providing the mental health resources that they were supposed to. And there was even this one uh, 
document that he showed me that the um, the company's own rules said that if we get a post that's been flagged for us, whether it's hate speech, it's misinformation, something that's been flagged to review because it might break Facebook's rules, and we don't have anyone on hand who speaks that language, just mark it as approved, just push it through the system. And that blew my mind because this is something I'd seen firsthand in Myanmar, something I'd seen reporting in Sri Lanka that I'd heard about in India and a couple other places, that people would flag like human rights researchers, like people or people in the government, people who are really trying to clean up the platforms on behalf of Facebook because they found Facebook wasn't doing it, would flag just outright, just horrifying incitement to genocidal violence. And Facebook would come back and say it doesn't break any rules and then it would get left up and then it would get a thousand likes. And it it turned it out that this was something yeah. It starts the fire, right. And it turned out this came from the the economics of these companies' arrangements with these outsourcing companies because they feel that they need to be able to scale up faster than they could by hiring people directly. Maybe they don't want to have these people on their payrolls for cultural reasons, economic reasons, whatever. So they go through these third parties that are sometimes hoodwinking them. Got it. Um, just so that I want to give you 30 seconds since this is Commonwealth Club. We speak to so much of Silicon Valley. What's your 30 second message to the people who are building these platforms, the designers, the engineers, the data scientists? Um, I think that we all thought, and I count myself in this, when I was someone who was writing headlines for social media 10 years ago, we all thought that um, this was something that was going to be inherently and intrinsically because it was open a force for good. And I think that we're learning that it has lots of causes. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, but that its effects on us are incredibly complicated and that sometimes we don't learn about them until we turn up that dial. And then someone like me has to look into it a year later and say, hey, this village burned down because we didn't understand what this thing was before we unleashed on the world. So my my hope is that if there is if there's one even slight cultural shift, it would be uh a sense that these stakes are high enough now that before we roll something out, even if we're really excited about our funding round, even if we're really excited about getting a bunch of users, that we think about its effects on society and on users because we know that they can go up to and including genocide. All right. Be intentional. Be really thoughtful about the choices we make. Exactly. I think that's a great place to end on. I wish we had more time. As you pointed out, we could spend hours on this subject. And it, it covers, Max's book covers so much more I, I highly, highly encourage you to go out and get a copy. Uh, my thanks to Max Fisher, international reporter and columnist for the New York Times and author of The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world. I, 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 as a person who's built many of these systems, I, I learned a tremendous amount. So I encourage you all to, to uh, learn even more by reading through it uh, carefully. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort to make virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. And you can also follow Max on Twitter at M-A-X underscore F-I-S-H-E-R. And I'm at D-P-A-T-I-L. And for more great content from the Commonwealth Club, you can always follow him also at CW Club on Twitter. I'm DJ Patil. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Max. Thank you so much.